All right, man. Do you want to talk about semantic searches? I do. We're going to talk about semantic search. Uh, so the idea roughly is we're going to talk about it here. Conceptually, you're going to draw stuff out for me. You're going to ask some questions. And then we're going to hop into um, we're going to hop into some code in TypeScript and talk through how we would actually implement that semantic search. Is that correct? Uh -huh. You like my uh, smiley face? I do. Very, very nice. It looks like you can fix the outer circle, but what's going on with the features? <laughs> So, awesome. um, yeah, like a lot of people kind of like come into semantic search and don't know what it's like based on, you know what I mean? Like kind mm -hmm. of like, like the basic differences between semantic search and, uh, you know, traditional search or lexical search. As, mm -hmm. you know, that's the professional folks right now. Um, so here are the basics, right? So like the, the, Lexical search uses keywords, right? Like mm -hmm. we have a, uh, you know, we have some documents that you can index, and then within that document, you will have um, like certain keywords that may be found throughout that document. And I'm drawing this. Tell me if you're seeing my drawings, my beautiful, beautiful yep, drawings. Looks good. Looks good. And then, yep, and I see uh, you're putting little keywords in there. And then the user will come in and be like, okay, so here's my query. And that's, this is gonna be like some uh, search engine right here. Um, the search engine will index these, right? And basically be able to retrieve the documents based on the query, right? That's hey, Roy, that's basic. Yeah, sorry, ahead. let me interrupt you super quick. Apparently, uh, I just got a friend text me. Apparently, you're quiet on the mic. I'm quiet relative, on the mic. Rel relative to me. So if there's something you can do to boost that. I can boost it. I can boost it. Let me boost it. Thanks for that heads up as well. Uh, that's because... Yeah, I think I just didn't have the... Mic in. Is it better now? I think it should be better now. Hopefully. Um Let's see if my, my insider wants to yeah. wants to confirm. Hey, insider. Yeah, better. Okay, better. better? We're better now. Sweet. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So um and, and by the way, like um I need to do a better job about looking at the chat. Um I'll keep an eye on it for you. So, yeah, if there are people that want, if there's people that want to ask questions in the chat, please do. Please um, feel free. That's why we're here. Please point, interrupt us. Yeah, the whole us. point is like yeah. not that like we are going to talk about stuff. I mean, we are going to talk about stuff, but like that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that we want to hear from you and we want to have a conversation at some level um, and like kind of answer your questions as we go. Okay, so okay, so this is this is semantic search. Uh, sorry, this is lexical search. Pretty straightforward. Yep. Um, you know, there's like a, a lot of other stuff, but this is like a simplified, simplistic way of looking at, at the world. Sure. Then um, we can talk about um, semantic search. I'll say like you know, so. Generally speaking, lexical search would work in situations where you're just doing simple queries and you need to match documents that have these keywords in them, basically. Basically. And you could apply other, you know, other techniques like TFIDF, you know what I mean? So like, the, like there's, there's more intelligence, intelligence that goes into the way that you're indexing documents and searching through them. Right. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in principle, right, you're doing some level of matching, right. Of a word yep. with other words, right. You could do, you could do other like things that are like linguistics, right. Like for like stemming a word, or stemming other words that you're like looking for, right? So like you know, you have a verb, right? You have the root of the verb, right? And all like the the the, the other you know versions of it. You know what I mean? Um, but it's mm -hmm. th these are all kind of still at the end of the, at the end of the day, you're doing some form of exact matching. Um, gotcha. Between okay. like the query and and the 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 um, the content that you've indexed. On the Makes other sense. end we have semantic search. And semantic search is basically based on the concept of embeddings. And what are embeddings? So um, 
embeddings are are essentially the result of what comes out of an a, a, a large language model, right? Mm -hmm. For the most part, um, that was trained on a whole bunch of data, right? So, like, basically, these models are essentially just like layers. Uh, I'll like go back, right? They're neural networks, right? What does that mean, right? Basically, you have these layers, and you have basically certain number of neurons in each layer, mm -hmm. in each layer, right? And then there's some activation function between these layers, right? It could be like a different, uh, a different activation function in each one, and essentially, we're we're when we're when we're showing this uh, net network a lot of data, right? And I'm not gonna go into like exactly how, but like what mm -hmm. data we're we're showing it because this is like a whole art, like there's a whole art to it. We're essentially yep. um, uh, adjusting the the weights that are affecting the way that these functions, um, pa like basically pass the data from one side of the network to the other side, right? Essentially, what happens as a result is that we get a, represent, a, a, a representation of, of our content as vectors in high dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of hard to um, represent high dimensional space, right? Um, in a piece of, on a piece of paper on, sure. or on an iPad. So instead, right, we'll just represent them in this silly 3D space. Okay. Sure. So we have this would be this would be the representation for different terms within this vector space, right? And each one of these are is is essentially a vector, right? And and it, again, a vector is just like a set of numbers, right? Zero point two, zero point three, blah, blah blah blah. It goes on and on and on, right? Based on the number of dimensions that we have for those vectors, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what happens? in these um in these models is that terms that have some uh semantic similarity are uh placed in a similar space than ones that don't have some semantic similarity so if i have right like i'm gonna have like these terms are gonna be semantically similar to one another right and these terms are gonna be semantically semantically similar to one another right the 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 meaning here is that like the distance and there's like there's like some similarity um metric right that you can apply to these to these vectors to say whether mm -hmm. or not they are similar or not right like you can think about it as distance or angle right mm -hmm. um there's different ways of looking at what constitute two two vectors to be similar to one another right mm -hmm. um so for example if I if you can think about these as being like the days of the week, right? Like just like Sunday here and Monday, right? Blah blah blah. And here, like you have like cat and dog, right? That makes sense. Makes sort sense. of. Yep, absolutely, definitely. Okay. And so, yeah, I don't want to jump the gun, but but keep going. No, uh, no, like no, the no, idea is that jump, we're going to start jump trying to get. Jump the gun. Okay, so we're going to try and get at. We're going to do a similar treatment to the user's query that's coming in and yeah. try and match it in, in vector space to what it semantically is the most similar to. Exactly. So, so the way that semantic search works is, again, you, you, start, you, you still have to like index your content, right? So like if I have my content over here and I have some embedding model down here, Right, I'm going to take that content and run it through that embedding model, and then guess what? I'm going to have to save it in a vector database. Wonder which vector database we're going to. I was use. going to ask you if you had any recommendations. I don't. I don't really. Um, okay. I heard about this small startup um, called Pinacone. Okay. It's Swedish. That's how they pronounce it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Is that why the food at IKEA tastes that way? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, 
so yeah like you save that you save that con you save that embedded um content in this vector database right and then okay. like you said the user comes in with their query right and that query has to go to the same embedding model because again we're going to try and find how this particular embedding falls within that same semantic space right um mm -hmm. that 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 all the users documents are 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 indexed in and what mm -hmm. are the most similar um uh indexed um um vectors within that within that uh within that index right to the user's query right yeah but the cool thing about um vector embeddings and vector databases in this in this context is that it's not just that you're taking the embeddings right that and, and you're saving them you're actually taking you, you can actually associate um more metadata with each mm. embedding that you create right and and we can talk about why why that's important because that kind of thing i don't know why but it kind of jazzes me up a little bit um, I, I think it's cool do you mind do you mind right before we do that i have an i have a quick thought like so to to step back and especially for folks that might have just joined or are watching later um we talked about so lexical search is one approach but it, it breaks down because it's at the end of not to paint with too broad of a brush but here i go uh, essentially, it's naive text matching at some level, right? So you might get back, I'm searching for cat, but I got back catalog. I actually wanted cat food. What we, what are the improvements in that scenario that you would expect to see from a system that's using semantic search? Right. Essentially, what is it doing better that lexical search can't do? Right. So embeddings give us um, access to, 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 to meaning, right? So like this is, and this is the core core aspect here so when i embed the word um queen right and i embed mm -hmm. the word king the embedding model knows quote unquote that there's some relation right there's some meaningful mm -hmm. relation between the word queen and the word king and so it places them in this this high dimensional vector space right they it, it places them to together right or close to one another right mm -hmm. same thing goes for sentences right if i have the sentence um the boy ran uh to the school right mm -hmm. and the boy ran home right the embedding model will know quote unquote that um there is some semantic correlation right between these two sentences but they are slightly diver divergent right so like mm -hmm. it will pick up on the the differences and it will pick up on the similarities, right? Whereas, well, before we before we compare this to to, to lexical search, right? Like we'll let's talk about how that's done, right? Like so. Basically, when we show like like these models all of this data, what are we showing them, right? We're show, we're we're basically giving them a lot of text, and this is one one example, right? Like one technique right like there are many ways of of training these models right but like one technique is masking for example which is i give the model sentences that are missing mm -hmm. certain words and then the 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 full sentence as as it's supposed to be right so like now mm -hmm. it's sort of starting to understand what words are supposed to be in those missing spots right mm -hmm. and the more and more and then i train it on billions and billions of of, of sentences like this Right, mm -hmm. and eventually it, the the model starts building again this this internal representation of the meaning of, of words, right? Like it mm -hmm. sort of kind of mm -hmm. knows how to like now complete the task on its own, right? And this is like just like one example, right? Yeah. So like this is how we imbue these models with the understanding of the meaning of the world, right? Like and these like I said the, the the internal representation of the model is essentially like some 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 uh it basically places different objects different discrete objects like words sentences paragraphs etc images right it places them in this space right in relation specifically in relation to one another right mm -hmm. and this is kind of mm -hmm. like how in, to some extent right like this is how uh, we as humans kind of understand the world at some level it's like mm -hmm. again it's a very simple simplistic way of looking at it right but it's but it's 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 accurate to say that you know we understand things by understanding the relationships between them right in a very fundamental level right um and 
the the internal representation of these um, LLMs also does something very 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 similar to that, right? Um, yep. And that's why it kind of behaves in a way, right? That al almost kind of feels almost human, right? Like al there, there's almost a human understanding of the relationships between things. Right? That's why it yep. excels at language so much, right? Definitely, um, definitely. So, to when I when it, when I think about like what's better about semantic search compared to say lexical search, right? Like to go back to your question, like you said, like when you're interacting with the lexical search engine, the users sort of have to know what they're looking for, right? Like so you're mm -hmm. kind of like sort of engine reverse engineering the 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 search engine in your head and you're like what is likely to be a term that has been indexed in the search engine right and that's how yep, we've used yep. to search in the beginning days of of google right like you know what i mean like we're actually like searching for actual keywords right yeah it might appear yep. in a text in a specific order and so and, and things of that of that nature yeah with semantic search right we can now start handle handling ambiguity right um, there's like an example that uh, James, our colleague, has used in his um, in his um, uh, slides, and I've ripped it off like in many of the other talks that I've given. And it's like, um, you know, I can't remember the sentence exactly, but it was like something like um, the bees decided to rebel against their queen was like one sentence. Right. And then another mm -hmm. sentence is. Um, the stingy insects decided to revolt against their matriarch or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. And a semantic search engine um, is capable of understanding, right? Like an embedding model, right? Like is, is a capable of understanding that even though these two sentences are using completely different words, right? They mean exactly mm -hmm. or, or almost exactly the same thing, right? And so in that case, we would expect to find them very close together in, in the high dimensional vector space. They will be. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Um, so which, which also means, uh, and then, you know, it's interesting, like you talk about the early days of Google and searching, it's like, we've all kind of experienced to some degree, I don't, depends on how strong your Google foo is that keywords themselves are insufficient to get you where you need to go. And so then you find yourself including like exclamation point, not that type of Apple. Right. Uh, and not this type of thing. I'm actually right. talking about that. Right. Right. But to your point about ambiguity, we can. And the reason that these LLMs and, and all the apps now that we're building with them and talking to feel so compelling and so human is that we can just talk to them mm -hmm. and get back. Yeah, that's what I meant. Like, I'm, I need you to X, Y, Z. And even if I say it with slang, uh, like it comes back with the correct answer and performs the task I asked it to. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the overall experience is, is almost like an eerie level of feeling like you're talking to an intelligent human on the other side of the computer, right? On the yeah. other side of the, the network connection. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I think like that, yeah, like that, that ability to deal with ambiguity is what makes it, like what, what takes it closer to the uncanny valley, right? Like is the yep. fact that like, how did you understand what I just said? Because like, I didn't quite understand what I just said, but you still, yeah. but you still kind of like figured it out anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. From context, and and you know sometimes uh, partly out of curiosity as a developer trying to break it, and um, and now because I enjoy it so much, I just ha I have my own nicknames for uh, all the different you know models I'm talking to and working with throughout the day coding, and so I'll say like hey you know home slice blah 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 expecting you know initially when I said that to get some kind of problem or something, it completely understands if I use developer slang of like I think you know the word gin. Um, Gin is most humans would probably understand gin as either a liquor or a card game, but developers I've noticed tend to use it as generate something for me. So I'll I'll often use it as shorthand say gin me that API route and it mm. comes back perfectly with here's the API route code. Interesting. Um, so so yeah no like the it's it is that context based awareness that feels like the uncanny valley is the right way to put it. It is very, uh, it's an intense feeling the first time you start interacting with them. <laughs> yeah, for real. Yep. Cool. Um, so I think for the rest of this session, what we'll mm -hmm. do is we'll sort of like build like an example of a simple semantic search engine um, in, in TypeScript. Um, okay. 
to kind of like get a better feel of like what does it exactly mean to to go about this process, right? So, um, so as you're doing that at a high level, essentially what this, this code we're gonna you're gonna write is gonna do is it's going to accept say a user query of some kind, convert that user query into the embedding like we talked about, uh, and then query a vector database that we've got set up on the back end and do a nearest neighbor search and find what is the most similar result in vector space and then return that to the user essentially. That's kind of what we're at a high level building. Right. Okay. So um, parts of this code um, already done, mostly because I, I didn't want to sort of quote unquote waste time on on um, you know the, the, the nitty gritty of like loading CSV files and you know things mm -hmm. of that nature. Um, yep. but um, so but we can still talk about them and and you know chat about like different like techniques and things that um, we like and don't like and whatnot. Um, I will say this. Um, I feel like it's like, you know, we're both like fans of JavaScript and everything. Um, sure. One thing I would say is that we're still missing a really, really good data, ma data wrangling and management um, um, uh, library a la pandas, right? Or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There is polars. Um, I don't have like a ton of experience with it. That's kind of like the only candidate that I've tried to use, but it's still, I feel like, like not like, so jo the JavaScript version of it is not their main kind of bread and butter. I think they're mainly in Rust. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, and so like the documentation is kind of like meh. And so I decided not to use it for this particular example. And I'm not really using it um, in a lot of places for anything critical, but um yeah, I feel like that's missing, right? I, I really, yep. really love to have something that, you know, knows how to do this stuff and, you know, have like the, 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 the really easy interfaces that pandas have. Um, so for, and uh, allow me to um, uh, embarrass myself publicly as, as not a real Python dev, but mm -hmm. just to try and do a very poor job of explaining to everyone what is, what is pandas. Essentially, it's it's like a delightful third-party library that you can load in Python that can pretty much slice and dice any type of CSV data or prepare it in such a way or handle arrays, handle nested arrays, handle dicts and nested dictionaries, et cetera, in such a way that is ideal for doing like heavy uh, machine learning and data processing type tasks, essentially. Yep. And so that's one of the things kind of writ large that we still notice is that the, the Python you know, ecosystem is very rich with these third-party libraries that have been built up over the years. And even though we JavaScript is really becoming a very compelling language to build these like AI applications in, what what is missing essentially is that same level of richness for third-party uh, libraries that handle data like that. Totally. One question I have real quick, total non sequitur, uh -huh, which uh -huh. looks super cool. On um, uh -huh. your line two, what is telling you the size of that thing? Uh, um, and it, this, like a little warning. This is a package, a sorry, an extension um, called npm IntelliSense. I'm pretty sure. Okay, cool. I think it's. I That's think it does handy. like. The, I think it does this, or maybe it's. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just like. Maybe it's just. Um, Maybe it's just VS Code. Maybe I'm wrong about this. That's super useful though, because is the idea that like in case, let's say that I'm hacking on something on the weekend and then I'm loading all these libraries and I've gotten to a point where it's like, whoa, you've got you know 18 megs of JavaScript dependencies loaded now. So see, um, I don't think it matters in the front in the back end. I think it matters in the front end right. more. You know what I mean? Exactly. Because like, the client bundle is going to get huge. Exactly. It gets going to get really, really right. big. Um, okay. But, like, but that's yeah. it's still super cool. I hadn't it's seen still that before. Super cool. so it's still super ask. cool. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah. See, this is how I learn about new things in JavaScript. Honestly, like it's like, oh, what is this cool thing? I want to. I want to. Yeah. I want it too. I want. I want it too. totally. I, totally. I can't tell okay. you how many times like I've had just like seen like others people either other people's code, or other people's like just setup right, like work mm -hmm. setup, and just like learned a ton, um, just through that. It's just like so for anyone that hasn't anxiety. watched our streams before together um the other time we streamed together roey got to watch me use neovim and he was an immediate convert he was like i don't know why i'm <laughs> wasting time in this code what you've got going is not only more performant it's also cooler <laughs> so 
exactly what happened. Uh, so yeah, that's exactly how it went down. Don't look at the recordings. <laughs> <laughs> Literally exactly how it happened. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So as an example of like what, what a good TypeScript kind of function definition would be, right? Cause we've been talking mm -hmm. about this, right? Yep. Um, having like this kind of like promise, like, uh, uh, type returned back to mm -hmm. you very helpful right um again i know that i'm going to get like a pop up parse result right like it's going to have like a certain structure right when i eventually load it I, i'm going to know how to like get into it and and actually get into the data right mm -hmm. um in this particular case like there's a little bit of like uh this is like the the annoying part right um because it's like string to unknown right um, and what is this unknown doing here? Um, but in in general, right? Like just like knowing exactly the the type of response that you're gonna get is super nice. Um, and also, sorry, just because we were talking about it, um, a bit before on the stream, but the fact that it returns a promise is how you know that you can await that, that function. You can await it. Yeah. Also. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. Cool. Um, it's like when I'll go into this thing here, right? Like, and I'll say just like. Um, uh, and I'll say, um, first I'll have to get, okay. So like there's, let's first, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping around the, let's just remember this thing. We have a CSV loader. We have to just give it a file path, file path, file path and we'll get back a bunch of CSV data. Um, sure. this, um, is like a bunch of utilities that I made, um, that are going to help us along the way. Um, specifically what we want to build here is like, um, a command line utility, right? That will allow us to say, hey, and like just run this with this file name and this particular column within the CSV file. Um, this is going to be our CSV file that we're going to use. It's just going to have, it just has like some ID and some text columns, right? That are kind of like, it doesn't really matter what they are at this point. They're just text, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're going to want to um, read those, read that file, and then choose the column and then um, uh, do create the index um, and index all like embed and index all of these things. And then after mm -hmm. that, um, we're going to want to um, query, right? So like, again, just passing in our query and then uh, uh, getting back a result. So gotcha. to, to do this, right, we'll need, like we, like we talked about before, we're going to need an embedder, right? Like something that will turn our, text from text into embeddings into vector embeddings. Mm -hmm. So um, here it is. Um, so I'm using um, uh, Zenova's um, transformers. So this is transformers JS. Um, awesome. For people who don't know, Zenova is this really awesome dude. His name, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to say his real name here because I don't know if he wants it shared in the world, sure. but um, uh he recently started working at Hugging Face. Um, so now it's fully blessed and is supported by Hugging Face itself, which is a mm -hmm. huge, by the way, like let's like take a moment here and say like, yeah. that's a huge mo moment for um, JavaScript, right? Like, and Big AI time. and JavaScript, right? Like where Hugging Face Big says time. like, hey, like JavaScript is like a legit path for um, interacting with these models. Um, and he now supports many, 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 many models. Um, yeah, which is really cool. Um, so that, and and to for, and also like so historically, this would have been a Python only thing, right? You could yeah. only get it in Python, or yeah. um, or you would have yeah. to basically stand up uh, an inference endpoint, which you could do, right? Like, but again, mm -hmm. under the hood, it would have been Python. Um, yeah, this is legitimately just like just JavaScript. And and by the way, like what he did was like not rocket science. It's it had it, it it's been um, enabled by um, Onyx, which is a framework from, I think, Microsoft, um, that basically is capable of taking all of these weights, right? So, like, basically, remember we talked about how these embedding models have weights in them, right? Mm -hmm. That's the thing that gets trained, right? These mm -hmm. weights are just, like, r persisted in a certain format, right? That is ready for, uh, for consumption by, uh, you know, Python frameworks like... Uh, TensorFlow in Python and Keras in Python and 
all these other machine learning mo- machine learning frameworks. It mm-hmm. Transformers just uses like um, I, be- I believe it uses uh, TensorFlow JS under the hood. I might be wrong about that, but I think it does. And I'm pretty sure that like these models have been transformed from. Um, and maybe if if Zenova came to our last one, I don't know if he's gonna if he's here this time. And if I'm talking out of my but then he could correct me um, about this. Um, but I'm pretty so I'm pretty sure it uses Onyx um, under the hood to kind of like to con- he uses them to convert these models to be in the in the format that is needed so that they could be read in this JavaScript environment. Um, part of me kind of wants to go spelunking for like a second. Sure, that's fine. I, and for what, go ahead. And what I was I was just going to share that for what it's worth to your point about it being a big deal for JavaScript. Um, if you anyone watching this now or in the future finds it interesting, we're we're actually working on an article about that in particular. Um, and I we referenced uh, Transformers JS specifically in it. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there's Tensor and Onyx. This is tensor. this is well, it's just called Tensor JS, but I don't know if it's ten, okay. it's an Onyx Tensor. So I think it's just Onyx. I don't think it's TensorFlow at all. Gotcha. Okay. Um, but this has to do with like again, like the way that like these um, these are th- at the end of the day, like there are a lot of matrix multiplication operations that are going on in, to- in order to actually give you back the results that you want, um, mm-hmm. and to do the actual inference, um, and then like the way those are actually carried out in JavaScript slash in Python are significantly different. It's like that's kind of like mm-hmm. way that where the divergence happens. Um, Good to know. Anyway. So um, this is kind of like not super important, right? Um, but I mean, it's it's helpful to know. I think the actual, um, since I wrote this, the actual um, syntax for doing this has changed somewhat. Um, but okay. I'm loading the I'm loading this this specific model again. This this particular model is um, all Mini LM L6 V2, which exists for Python, but has been converted for this particular purpose for loading in transformers js um like if you just took like um whatever like sentence transformers slash like whatever that would mm-hmm. not work out of the box because it's not it doesn't have the same uh trans like same uh converted weights right that this one has um mm-hmm. and this is why you're loading it this way then the embedding function just basically calls this pipeline um with and and it passes and, and you pass in the text that's it, right? Like, there's nothing super special going on. The mm-hmm. interesting part, again, and this is what we talked about before with TypeScript bits, right? Like, is that like I wanted to make sure that what I get back from this embedder are vectors that are ready to be embed that, that are ready to be saved, right? Mm. By Pinecone, right? Nice. And it and it, that means, right? Like that, if for example, if I added um, a field called uh, schmetadata, right mm-hmm. here. Instead of metadata, um, it's going to be yelling. It's going to yell at me, right? And it's going to say object literal may only specify properties, but metadata is not does not exist on type vector, right? Like I don't mm-hmm. know what this is, right? Please, blah, 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 please fix this to metadata. Nice. Yeah. Um, this is the this is the 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 reason why it's helpful and like say, similar here, right? Like if I just went like, uh, so like result data, right? Just happens to be any and any, right? That's what I get mm-hmm. back from um the the pipe right like if i just gave it like a bad type would it yell at me hmm interestingly it does not yell at me right now which is bizarre it should yell at me uh, because it's not an array um interesting let, let me ask a uh newbie typescript question on line 16 so i noticed like the the promise only returns a vector mm-hmm. is that because even if you the the whatever uh, function is going to return that promise were to say fail and not able to populate a vector, it could still return you an empty vector. So therefore, it doesn't need to also possibly return null or something. It's not well, vector or I it, failed. Like, it's why not is a vector that? or I failed because the, because the promise can fail, right? So like it mm-hmm. will always return a promise, right? Um, and the promise itself could fail. Honestly, okay. well, while you're saying this though, this should not be the case, right? This should be like wrapped in a try catch okay. and right, like checked, right? Like somewhere. Okay. Right. Um, so this is kind of like you're right. Like this has to be like I was wondering if it was because of um 
then again, this is just a stupid question, but like if it were, say for example, promise, I get, yeah, you're right. The promise could fail. It could be rejected as opposed to fulfilled. But right. if it were just returning, say an array instead of a vector, like the array, you might expect it to have values or I could return you an empty array on failure, right? And so that's why I wondered if it was literally just a single type in the promise as opposed to what I sometimes see, which is like- Right, it could be like this or this undefined thing. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. It it, it probably should be that, right? Okay, got it, Um, got it. Because it could fail, right? Like, so if I had an actual try catch type, let's actually do that. Undefined, yeah, okay, got it. And then is that, and then is that's also the union type in TypeScript, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, cool. cool. Anyway, so embed batch basically calls. It's like a convenience function, right? To be able to take an array of uh, an array of uh, 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 strings, right? In this mm-hmm. case, it would be just like bunches of our of our of our CSV. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we slice those into chunks. Right into a certain batch size, right? So I could give it like a billion, right? But have a, a chunk size of a hundred, and we'll just do a hundred at a time, and that will just basically um, create the embeddings for those batches a hundred at a time, or whatever the size is, and then call the on batch function, on batch uh, undone batch function, right? So like the plan is going to be that I'm going to take my CSV, I'm going to read it, I'm going to take these, and I'm going to say embed them. And then when you're done embedding a batch, upsert that batch. Uh, that's what the on the done batch does. Got it. Yeah. So like here, okay. just like be like, it's 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 going to be here. I'm saying like th- this function, right, that I'm going to pass is going to be a function that's going to take a, a set of embeddings, right, mm-hmm. and return nothing. Right. right. Hence the void. Okay. Hence the void. Cool. So I think Very cool. we're, we're uh, this to... is a this is literally my own curiosity and it's, this is kind of beyond the scope of this but uh let's say like the line 36 to 38 mm-hmm. um we deploy this app we're happy with it it's going great we get more traffic than we expected now we've got a bottleneck here is there a way already to do a fan out type deal that is sane um or is it all kind of uh you don't want to go down that road. So that's an excellent question. Um, I almost brought it up before in our long, in our pregame conversation about you know async await and how wonderful it is and da 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 da. Yep. Working with workers, for example. Um, mm-hmm. So like to, and this is one of the things that I really want to do, but makes like this whole this whole example ten times more complex, right? For sure. Is being able to take like each batch and separate it out to 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 specific workers right got it yeah this is not like an impossible thing to do but it's definitely complex right okay um that might be interesting for the future it might be like yeah it might be like a very interesting thing to do for for scaling up totally yes yeah when you say workers are you talking about um javascript web workers no because we're not in the web right like we're in node right oh right right, right, it just literally means like like sub processes yep threads sub processes they're going to be yep. they're going to okay. they're going to actually run on whatever machine this is running okay. right got it and 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 even more interesting to me right would be to say like hey can we actually spin up um like complete machines right with like more nodes you know what i mean like really take it like like to a distributed kind of um setup right where it's not mm-hmm. just thread on a single machine right but like it's actual separate machines that, that fan out. And then if you really, really want to get into pain, then you dynamically spin up VMs in the cloud for you to do that and or firecracker VMs or something crazy. <laughs> but by the way, faster. like that's not that far fetched because like think about, you know, just, you know, edge functions, right? Like workers, right? Right. Like in, in the cloud, right? Like if, if they are capable, the thing that they're not quote unquote capable or not uh, optimized for is to do workloads like, um, like do like embeddings, right? Like in a work in a in a worker, right? Like it's not what they're mm-hmm. built for, but in theory, right? You should be able to say like, hey, I just want to spin up like ten thousand workers, ten thousand yeah. like you know, and then and then have them do the embeddings and in, in insertion, and it should work. And then, yeah, and then 
and then die off and then charge me for what I what I actually used C CPU time and then exactly. we're good. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That 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 would be super cool. Okay. So now we've got ideas for a future stream on extreme performance enhancement through multi-threaded uh no. that would be actually really cool. <laughs> okay, <laughs> really I'm writing like, it down. Really like that. writing it down. All right. Sweet. Um cool. Um so let's start writing some code. Okay. Okay. Wait. The one one thing that we do need um, is to write like a little client for ourselves. Um, so like the client is going to be improved a lot. So all of this bit that I'm going to write now, it's actually not going to be needed for much longer because we're going to come out. We're coming out with our actual prod um ga of like the node client which is super awesome. cool um, when are we expecting that roughly can we share that or not mm, i'm um, not sure i am not sure i think very okay. soon very soon is what i can okay. what i can definitely say cool yeah that'll be fun then we can do we can do some streams and some sample apps with that for sure yeah um and it's not like it's not substantially different mm -hmm. um from what we currently have but like there's def definitely better like you know this this bit we when i'm doing like right right here right is kind of like annoying right to have to do this right like in two calls you have to like like create a pinecone client and then from that pycon pycon client you have to like um you have to init and then you have to await it and like basically use a singleton so that like, you know, if it's already there, you return it. If it's not there, you, you create it, all that stuff. Yep. Ugh. I had to figure that out when I, when I was first using it, uh, in a, so in a Next.js project. And it was like, what's going on here? Yeah. It's, it's um, really annoying. Yeah. And, and it's yep. just due to the fact that like, um, when this initial one was created by me, um, I did a shitty job <laughs> and um, just like, you know, did the minimal viable product that I could do um, and didn't care much about anything. So now it's going to be much better. Um, You're all good. Let's see if I can actually chat with the stream chat. Apparently my, my little, uh, my same little birds have told me that that, that plugin you were referencing import before cost. is called import costs. Import costs. And that there's, and and Roy, you'll be very relieved to hear that there's a NeoVim version. Whew. <laughs> Ooh, made by Wix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the reason I don't know about this is like I made this like I probably installed it like oh no, I must have installed it recently because I have it. So, anyway. It's weird. Um very nice. okay. Very nice. Cool. So we have like 15 minutes, so like we should zoom ahead. Let's zoom through it. Okay. So the next thing we want to do is um, start just like bit by indexing the thing. Um, I'm going to very quickly and somehow uh, without people seeing it, like I'm mm -hmm. going to do it so quickly that people are not going to see and I'm going to change my keys right after this. Uh, actually, what you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do this. <laughs> You're making me nervous, but okay. For a second. Right. For a second. <laughs> Because I just don't want to share my keys, but I need my environment keys. Um, yep, 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 yep. So I just I just added those. Um, okay. Without people seeing, because like, yep. Um, and let's close this. Let's save that. We saw the embeddings and the embeddings. Blah blah blah. Yeah, like we're just ex exposing it in like a better instance because we don't need to instantiate this every time. Um, and we have our Pinecone client, and that's cool. CSV loader, that's cool. We don't need to look at this right now and not that right now and not this right now let's look at index okay that's the that's really the the inter where the where the interesting parts come in right yep so yep. we'll do some object destructuring and we'll grab the csv path and the column Columna from Job on uh, podium is it? Is that where you right? Are now? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. What's really uh, dangerous is they have this fun dashboard that if you log in with your GitHub auth, it'll show you how many completions you've accepted and and in which languages. Ooh. 
And I find that I find that very addictive because I go and I look and I'm like, oh man, everything from I've touched all these files today. Like, uh, it's kind of interesting. It, it's more than you might think. Okay, so then then we need a Python client, a Pinecone client. What do I call it? What do I say? A pine, Python client. Cool. Yep. Then we want. Let's see if uh, Codium can do this. I'm gonna say uh, read uh, CSV. Read. Do you see it? It also got the the pattern correct of create the index if it doesn't already exist. Where? What? Oh, that was there. It was suggest. It was suggesting that is the next thing before you started telling. Before oh, yeah. you started typing out your comments. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so this is not exactly what I want, but it's very close. Um, and this is what I get back from uh, Papa Parse, right? So like Papa Parse gives me back um, both two of these things, right? Like it gives me back mm -hmm. um, the data itself and it gives me back metadata, right? And that metadata, and we'll just gloss over this bit, it's ba basically um, going to tell me which, which of the columns are in that, uh, in that file. Right, mm -hmm. so I could do this, right, and say, "Hey, if you don't have the field um, that the sorry the column that um, I'm asked that, that the users asked for, then just mm -hmm. fire out." There we go. Nice. And by using the question mark, you can safely say only uh, run the includes function on this previous object if it is, if it it has, is not undefined. Yeah. Correct. No, exactly. Because yeah. this because fields it prevents be, a crash. It can be under. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Okay, and then <clears throat> I need to basically extract like all of the text from each one of these, right? So like now I have rows with columns, right? So I'm gonna do something like this. Uh, I'm gonna map over the data. Mm -hmm. Whoops. And I'm gonna say, give me the column right like the 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 from this row give me the column right um i mean this makes sense right so like i'm map like mm -hmm. this row has or this map this data has like just rows in it with multiple mm -hmm. columns in it and i'm just yep. wanting to get whatever column the user wanted okay cool. next i'm going to need an index right so let's see if uh, codium can do this i'm still going to say create a pinecone index with the uh with uh 384 dimensions uh using the index name provided oh using uh and index name eh, whatever let's see if that works so yes mm, no okay so create created so it doesn't really understand that like this is the signature Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's actually supposed to take client and then index name and then 384, which is what we're starting with this pinecone client. Right. And 384 is basically the dimensions that we get back from um, the embedder. So it's to dependent be, on the model that you use. Yes. To be quite honest, it probably be, would be nice to have a method on the embedder. Um, that will tell you like how many like what the dimensions are, um, just so that so you, you can just call that, that and not have a yeah. magic number in there. Um, so you just call not, it every time you use it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure if that's doable uh, with this current version of um, Transformers JS, but um, yeah, well, that's like a, an improvement that you should probably look into. Um, nice. Okay, and then we want. Okay, so we we want to need to we we're gonna need to uh, initialize the embedder. So let's look at the embedder again. The embedder had this like init function, right, that we have to call to just get things going and the the, the pipeline going, right? So we're gonna have to call mm -hmm. that. Then we're gonna new, do the actual meaty part, which is we're gonna call embed batch, right? And what are we gonna call embed batch on? Nice. So it's gonna say this sweet and then let's see oh wow look at this right it's got it down 
I'm telling you, man. It's got it down. It's even it even updated your progress bar. Um, I have my counter. Where's this counter coming from? Oh, I have my counter right here. Sweet. Uh, why is it mad about that? Because I don't need to pass the Python client. I need to pass the index. Uh, Vector operations API. Oh yeah. yeah so I need to. Be... I need to. Oh, this is something I forgot to do. I need to get. I need to get. It's to a, the It's that. I know what you mean. Yeah. I've because in Python I do the same thing where it's like you got to first eat with the index name create the index class. Instantiate the index class essentially. Okay, this is this could come after this. Okay, now and we're cooking with gas. It takes the index and it takes the embeddings, and then I need to give it a namespace. This is the last thing. Um, should we talk about namespaces a little bit? Um, sure. What are they good for? Um, so namespaces. What are they? Basically, they're they're essentially like you can think of them as almost like sub indexes in your index, right? Um, if you want to say have like multiple users and each user you want each user to have their own little space, right, within your index, right? Like where mm -hmm. they don't really care about like anything that's going on with other users, but they only care about whatever happened with their own content, right? Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. you would namespace them under you would use their user ID or user whatever username as their mm -hmm. namespace. The 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 that's good for some things, bad for others because you can't query across namespaces. Okay. Right. So you just have to use them if you need to. Um, the other ways of and that's like one way to like separate out, um, you know, embeddings from one another. Right. Like it it, mm -hmm. it might improve performance in some situations um you don't mm -hmm. want to do that when you again like want to search over across those namespaces in that case you just use metadata um to do the separation although that also comes at a cost right it's like it's kind of like a trade-off right like you can either search across like you know the metadata but then you take a you, like the cost is, is is that if it's high cardinality data um meaning like there's many many different values right um, for that field, for example, a user ID, right? Like you'll have as many of them as you have users, right? If mm -hmm. you index mm -hmm. on that, that's gonna that's gonna cause you to take like some performance hit on the um, on the, on any kind of search that you'll run on that index, right? Versus using namespaces where you're not going to take that search, you're not gonna take that hit. You're basically going to like limit the search to that particular namespace, and then the search go, goes on from that point on. Gotcha. I'm, I'm really curious. The place my mind goes is I'm curious is, is it more about the organizing of, of data and querying it in efficient means, or would it also be sufficient for certain multi-tenant use cases? Um, Cause you, you did mention like, you know, like you could, you could segregate user data across namespaces, for example, but yeah. Does it provide strong enough guarantee? Maybe a question for another day too. Does it provide strong enough guarantees to be used in a security sense, or would you rather create new indexes at that point for each each user? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it de really depends on like the the strictness, right? Like of separation, right? Because like for example, mm -hmm. like in the EU, like in the EU, right? Like like user data has to be physically se separated, right? And so. I believe, and this is something that you might have to check, double check, right? But I believe that uh, namespaces actually do give that um, guarantee because they're literally separate tables, right? Ah, nice. Um, okay. Aggregated under one pod, right? Um, okay. The question is like, what is it going to be like in V4 or whatever when you go serverless? Um, we might have to cut this thing, this bit out. Uh, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, like the the bottom the bottom line is that um, it really depends on on the specific okay. use case. Cool. It's a, it's a cop out, but that's what that's I fine. No, no, no. I was just, maybe another. I wrote it down as another interesting topic for a future date. Um, yeah. So this is pretty much all that we have to do here mm -hmm. um, to 
get this going. And we're just gonna, so like we have this progress pro progress bar, by the way, like I love yep. this library, it's really cute. Is it nice? It's nice. Um, nice. I mean, you could, you could, I mean, I've done literally zero to, um, to uh, make it look any kind of decent in the CLI, but like it's just like really well written. Nice. I, I really love progress bars. It makes such a difference, like when you have a, especially the CLI. Like, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, just say like, um, perfect. Um, shall we try this out? Sure. The other question I have for you uh, to ambush you live with is: no, no. Are you, <laughs> do you are you planning to or already have this pushed up somewhere so that folks that watch this later? Um, we can yes. go find your repo in GitHub. Yes, um, this is actually already up there. Um, there's nice. a, a semantic search example um, on our docs, um, and you can click it and get to the repo. And this this is up there, working. You can try it out. Uh, we're Excellent. So Google Pinecone Docs. And, yeah. Yep. Google Pinecone cool. Docs, and it's there. Um, how do you Excellent. share links on a Twitch stream? I don't know. Uh, I don't know, but when I when we make this a YouTube video, I'll make sure that it gets into the description. Um, Cool. So I'll link directly to it. Um, all right. So you know what? I'm just seeing that we have like a minute left. And instead okay. of just running it, which we'll just like run and insert things and da 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 like not as, ex yep. not, not, not as exciting. Let's just take a quick look at query. Um, okay. Because it basically it's like the other side of the coin. And that's kind of like be the, the complete like the story, right, that we told in the sure. beginning. Um. So similar to what we did before, we're just querying the command line to get like the query. And we're also asking for this top K variable, which just means like how many results do we want to see, right? Um, that mm -hmm. are similar, right? To the results that were, that, to, the, to the query that we're looking for. Um, mm -hmm. Then similarly, we just shoot, we select the index. We still have to initialize the embedder because again, it's a separate process. So it's like starting the embedder all over again. We query mm -hmm. the embedding. So like now instead of doing like a batch uh, a batched embedding process and upsertion. We're just querying one one thing, which is the query. We embedding mm -hmm. we're embedding one thing, which is the query, and then we build a query um, request uh, to Pinecone, which includes the values of the, vec the, the 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 values of these query of the query embedding, right? So like this will be mm -hmm. like our long list of of, lim of numbers, the array of numbers, the top k, whether or not we want the metadata. Whether whether or not we want the actual values to come back, um, I find like that looking at the values is not very helpful um, in mm -hmm. most cases, right? Like it's usually about the metadata, and then obviously the namespace that we're going to search within, right? So um, if we haven't provided any kind of namespace before, we wouldn't have to do this. But if we did, we have to specify in the namespace. Otherwise, nothing will be found. Learned that the hard way um, after just like indexing stuff with namespaces and then searching for them, and then nothing comes back, and you're like, what? What have I done wrong? <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. And what we get back is basically just like a set of um, results that have um, some text that I'm, I'm ex like taking out from the metadata and um, the score for each uh, for each uh, sim like um, for each match. Right. So we know how gotcha. how how similar. Right. Um, that match was. And that is actually quite important. Right. Like it's like. It's not that you're just that you're just get, getting similar results, right? Like you can say how similar they are because it's it's possible that your query is actually not similar at all, right? Um, but mm -hmm. you'll still get, you know, your top K will be populated with matches, right? That have a, a, a score of zero point three, right? Zero point mm -hmm. two instead of like you know high high likelihood of actual similarity, which is like you know zero point nine or point eight or point seven, and like that score is going to depend upon the amount of actual data that you have in your data set, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like the, the likelihood of the embeddings to actually be correct, right? Because um, again, if you have like, you know, three documents in there, right? Unless you're actually requesting for them, like actually querying for those particular documents, right? Or data that's definitely in those documents, you might get like, you know, all, you'll always get results, but they'll always be like bad, right? Mm -hmm. so the more data you have, Right, the more diverse the data is, the higher, obviously, the higher likelihood that you'll get back something, some, some significant, meaningful results back. 
Gotcha. And so the other nice thing about it is that it's sort of a knob that you have access to tune as needed in order to like, depending on what you, what type of performance you're seeing in your application once you've got this wired up too. Exactly. Um, just super curious, why, why is uh, line 39 required? I'm sure 38 is required because 39 is required, but why, why 39? It's because the um, scored vector, um, let's just like see what happens right when I do this. Metadata doesn't have it's is defined currently as an object right okay it's like it yep. doesn't know what it is right how would mm -hmm. i fix that right how would i do this right so like i could do something like this right say that my i can say that type metadata equals um, text string oops what was that text string right and then i could do as text Uh, okay. Right. And now I don't have to do this ignore anymore. Okay, cool. Sorry. As so, and then, so you're essentially co coercing it on line 44 into the new text type that you it's defined up table. above. It's doing the text type, right? Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah. So awesome. either, either, either one of these could work. I just thought it was just like, yeah, um, a bit too much work to, to just get at the text. Uh, but yeah, like there, there. It's actually quite interesting to think about, um, like how do you type metadata correctly, right? So you can pull it out, right, um, on the mm -hmm. other end, as part of like building your app. Um, that's that's actually worth thinking about. Hmm. Very cool.